All right, so today we are working our way through the digestive system. This is day two. Um, objectives today, we got a lot of them. We want to understand all of the individual organs within our digestive system, uh, the processes by which we are going to move those materials around through the body. So we are going to sort of track the journey of food, uh, which is why I warned you yesterday, it's going to get real gross today. Uh, <laughs> we'll talk about the anatomy of the stomach and how um, digestion actually works and then eventually works its way into the small intestine where we'll start experiencing a little bit more digestion but really the heavy lifting of uh, absorption is going to take place then we'll work our way through uh, some of the hormones uh, sort of accessory organs and things like that that are associated with um, the digestive system work our way into the large intestine and then uh, get uh, all of that food out of the body uh, and then at the very end of le the lesson, you'll notice as, as we get towards the end, we stop talking about the um, process of digestion and we will break down uh, a little bit about nutrition and calories and really describe like what a calorie is and, you know, how really we, we just use it for energy and stuff. So, so uh, as a brief overview, when we're talking about the digestive system, we are talking about, you'll notice it says here, the mechanical and chemical breakdown of foods. Um, you know, your digestive system, it's called the digestive system, but it really does have like a couple different roles. You know, it's in charge, obviously, of digestion, which is the process of just like breaking stuff up. Um, but it's also in charge of absorption, right? And absorption is how we are going to get nutrients to pass into our actual bloodstream. And so now they're actually sort of properly inside of our body, you know? Um, and then uh, we are gonna talk a little bit about, you know, after that, uh, once we've absorbed all the stuff we need, there's all the leftovers, you know, and all that leftover stuff, um, you know, that is going to exit the body uh, through like excretion. So we're, we call that elimination, right? So we're gonna first start by digesting foods and digestion, uh, like I said, it's not just, um, you know, a lot of times we think of it, it's, it's like it sits in your stomach, right? Your stomach kind of blur and dissolve things. And that's chemical breakdown for sure. But there's also mechanical breakdown. I mean, you know, when you think about like chewing your food, right? Um, even the process of chewing is part of digestion. It's, it's, it's the mechanical breakdown. You know, you take a piece of, uh, let's say apple, you know, um, Let's see here. I'm gonna see if I can. How how bad is this gonna look? Uh, little apple here, and then we put a little stomach, right? You take <laughs> you take an apple and you chew it once, right? You you chew a chunk off of that thing, right? Um, and so then you're left with like a little apple chunk, and then you know you're gonna bite through that again, and then you're left with you know two apple chunks, and then you're gonna bite through it again, and you're left with you know, four apple chunks, you know, like eventually until, you know, it becomes, you know, little microscopic bits, right? That is digestion and, you know, it's taking place in your mouth. Um, so there is a little bit of mechanical breakdown and there's also a little bit of uh, chemical breakdown because we actually need to get that food to be so small that it can literally pass through the walls of our body. Because here's what's kind of funny. And you're going to hear this in a video that we show in a little bit. Um, when it comes to digestion, you and everybody, uh, we're all basically like human donuts, you know, like you think about like putting food, you know, it's like, I need to put food into my body, right? <laughs> like, um, you think about like food being inside your body, right? But technically it's not really like inside your body. It's technically outside your body. Like when you think about like what your digestive tract is, right? Your mouth, uh, even your nose, right? in your mouth um, travels. It is an, a, a tube that runs through your body. It's a tube of outside that runs through your body, right? Kind of like a donut, right? Like you wouldn't say, you wouldn't say if you had a donut, you know, um, that's not the best donut in the world, but <laughs> you wouldn't say if you put something right here, um, that that's, you know, if you put something in here like this, that's not inside the donut, right? That's inside the outside part of the donut, you know, but if you put it in here, now it's in the donut, right? 
That's kind mm -hmm. of how your digestive tract really works. You know, what we are doing is if you now picture this as like the tube and you're looking, you know, if you were looking down somebody's throat, right, that like this, right, if they've got food in here, it's not really in their body until it passes through the walls into here. And once it passes through the wall, you know, now it's in our bloodstream, right? Now it's in the actual like body body, right? This is one of the biggest parts of your immune system, by the way. Um, this is why, you know, there are certain viruses out there that uh, really can only be transported by blood. If you were to like drink like a jar of that virus, you know, uh, which, you know, I don't exactly recommend doing that, but if you were to do it, honestly, your stomach acid would kill all of it. It wouldn't really affect you in any way, you know, but if it somehow gets into your bloodstream, because maybe you've got like a cut in your cheek or, you know, something like that, that interrupts it, maybe you had like, uh, you ate something too big and it, you know, damaged. Now, if it can get into your bloodstream, well, now you're in trouble, you know, um, that's, that's really where it, it actually kind of gets into you, which is why viruses don't really, you know, travel through that way. A lot of times instead they go in our nose and, you know, we touch our eyeballs and things like that. And those also kind of lead to our bloodstream. Um, so, uh, digestion is the process of mechanically breaking food into small chunks and then chemically breaking that food into even smaller chunks where it gets literally so small that it can just pass straight through the walls of our small intestine right into our bloodstream. Imagine how small something has to be to literally pass through the walls of your body. You know, like imagine if you were like, a, you know, if you absorbed your food through your like hand, like you just kind of stick your hand on your food and you leave it there for a few minutes and it just kind of passed into your bloodstream. Imagine if we ate that way, it'd be very weird, right? Um, so the digestive system is the system responsible for mechanical, which is like things like chewing and folding and chemical breakdown of foods and the absorption of those nutrients by our body cells. So we're gonna break that down into a couple different like little sections here. Um, we're gonna call that ingestion, which is the process of getting food into our actual you know, mouth. Uh, propulsion, which is getting it to travel from the various parts of our digestive system. Mechanical processing, which is stuff like chewing. <laughs> Digestion, which is the chemical processing. Uh, secretion, that's one of the things your digestive system does. Your body will also secrete certain materials into that canal. Um, you know, for instance, stomach acid, when you eat a big meal, your body will make more stomach acid and secrete that in. Uh, absorption, which is allowing that uh, material to pass into the bloodstream. And finally, excretion, where there's really nothing left except for waste products. And so your body is going to go ahead and, and let those pass out of you. So uh, we are going to divide your digestive system into two primary divisions. <clears throat> One is going to be what we call your alimentary canal, uh, which is really the digestive system, right? Or your digestive tract, you'll hear people say sometimes, right? The alimentary canal is basically this big, long tube that runs through your body, right? It's the tube of outside that kind of runs through your body. Uh, it's about eight meters long, by the way, which is pretty freaking long. Um, that's like somewhere around 24 feet, uh, you know, that passes through your thoracic and abdominal cavities, right? And you're like, well, how the heck is it 24 feet? Well, you're not exactly 24 feet long, but basically there's parts of it and they kind of fold back and forth and back and forth, kind of like this. But if you were to stretch the whole thing out, it'd be about eight meters, which is wild, you know? Um, so, uh, and here it is, right? You can see here, it's gonna pass from the mouth down the esophagus into uh, the small intestine. You'll see it'll kind of work its way around there and then make sort of a lap around and that's the large intestine and eventually work its way out of the body. So, like I said, it's, in, it's responsible for ingestion and propulsion and, uh, oh, gotcha, no problem. We'll see you in a minute. Um, mechanical processing, digestion, secretion, absorption, and excretion. Um, so when I say the alimentary canal, what I'm talking about here, right? Uh, like I said, it's this eight meter long muscular tube that passes through your body, right? Um, and that is really how we allow 
uh, food to sort of uh, be exposed to uh, all of the various sections of our digestive system to allow for maximum absorption. Um, uh, So, um, you know, when we talk about like the ideas of digestion, right, we're really going to see like a lot of different layers here. Um, and those different layers are going to do different things. So for instance, when we get to the stomach, right, your stomach has like all these really interesting overlapping layers. Uh, and a big part of that is making sure that your stomach doesn't really digest itself. You know, um, it is filled with uh, uh, stomach acid, which is, you know, really designed to to sort of dissolve proteins and meats and stuff. And so like, you know, you think about like what you're made out of, you're made out of proteins and meat, you know? <laughs> like, So luckily your digestive system doesn't dissolve itself and then eventually start eating you. Um, although it does sometimes do that to certain people. I don't know if anybody in here has an ulcer, um, but basically what an ulcer is, is where stomach acid gets to a place uh, and then it dissolves a little hole through the actual stomach and, you know, it burns really bad because it's basically leaking out that very acidic material. <sighs> but it's got a lot of different layers to sort of protect itself and some of those layers are filled with uh, or lined with what we call mucus and mucus is sort of like the anti stomach acid. Um, so, you know, uh, this is sort of like if it was laid out here, you can see it's going to work its way through your mouth and it's attached to some salivary glands where you're going to kind of put some spit in your mouth and that'll help it make it easier to process food and stuff. And then it'll work its way into the, the, the stomach here and, you know, bathe all that food into the stomach acid. And then eventually it'll work its way into the small intestine here where, you know, a little bit more digestion is going to take place thanks to the pancreas. You're going to create some enzymes there. They're going to help break down any food that didn't get broken down the stomach and, your liver is going to create this material called bile, which is going to help break down fats, which fats don't really break down very well in stomach acid. They're, they're you know, uh, uh, they don't really uh, dissolve all that well. But luckily, your liver is going to make this material where uh, that we call bile, and it's going to store it in the gallbladder and drop it off in the small intestine there. And that'll break down fats. And now, everything's really broken down. And so it's going to kind of work its way through this tube and stuff's really just going to get absorbed the whole time, kind of working its way into our bloodstream until eventually, you know, the only thing left in there is like waste products and like a lot of water. Right. And so, uh, and, and electrolytes, that's another big one. And so that'll go into your large intestine and your large intestine is going to start pulling all that water out of there. It's going to start dehydrating. Uh, that wet soupy mixture that used to be your food. And that's really where it's going to absorb a lot of your water and it's going to absorb a lot of your um, uh, minerals and electrolytes and things like that until eventually that wet soupy material has been so dehydrated. What happens when we dehydrate stuff? You might remember from yesterday, it starts linking together and so it starts all kind of coming together and eventually it becomes this kind of hard packed uh, stuff that we call our stool, you know, and that's uh, where we're going to kind of get that out of our body, right? Because, um, you know, we're, we're done with it. So that is really the entire process of digestion from, from start to finish in two minutes, you know? <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and uh, kind of go through that in a little bit more detail. And actually, before we do, I do want to show you a little video here. Uh, uh, it's not the one I want. I want this one. All right. Oh, hi. <laughs> I love how this is like obviously a green screen. <laughs> All right. So this is going to be helpful because it's got some animations that are going to kind of walk us through. Uh, the digestive process here. Oh, hi. I hope you don't mind that I'm eating. This is actually just my first course. For, for my birthday, the writers wrote me a script where I just get to eat the whole time. And I can't think of a better way to demonstrate the workings of the digestive system, the series of hollow organs that we use to break down and process nutrients and energy we need to function. Though, uh, wait a second. If I remember correctly, uh, digestion is actually pretty freaking disgusting. So maybe I shouldn't be eating right now. Whatever. Waiter!
The digestive system is so fundamental that it's basically step number one in the guide to how to make an animal. You probably remember that during the embryonic development of most animals, the digestive tract is the very first thing that forms. When the blastula, that little wad of cells that we all used to be, turns into a little wad of cells with a tube running through it, that tube is your digestive system. And pretty much every animal has a digestive system of some kind, but they're not all alike. Far from it. In fact, digestive tracts are specially adapted to animals' feeding behavior and diet. For instance, a housefly eats mostly liquid or very finely granulated food, but before it does that, it's got to puke its digestive juices all over its lunch and then let them digest it for a while before it sucks it up into its mouth. If we did it like that, first dates would be less common. Most vertebrates put food in one end of the tube and our digestive system processes it and then it gets rid of the waste out the other end of the tube. No muss, no fuss. Well actually there's a little bit of muss at the end, you may have noticed. But the beauty of it is that this whole process is run by our autonomic nervous system so we don't have to think about it until maybe the very last step when we're in traffic and just had two cups of coffee and a bran muffin. Then we have to think about it a little bit. Among vertebrates, the digestive tract might be short or long or have organs that do different things depending on what its feeding habits are. For instance, dogs are mostly carnivores and also scavengers. They mostly eat meat, but sometimes that meat's been dead for a while. So the dog's digestive system has developed to take food in, absorb as many nutrients as possible, and then deposit it on somebody's lawn all in a period of about six hours. Dogs have a- Oh shoot, sorry guys. I accidentally hit the button. What if you could get rid of your kitchen <laughs> with the push of a button? Oh. Hey, I'm Matt from Pila, and I- Sorry about that. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Sorry, we're just getting this video here, and where were we? I'll, I'll recap on the- on Canvas. Yeah. <laughs> um, God dang it. Not all alike. Far from it, in fact. ...is so fundamental that it's basically step number one in the guy- <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. The digestive system is so fundamental that it's basically step number one in the guide to how to make an animal. You probably remember that during the embryonic development of most animals, the digestive tract is the very first thing that forms. When the blastula, that little wad of cells that we all used to be, turns into a little wad of cells with a tube running through it, that tube is your digestive system. And pretty much every animal has a digestive system of some kind, but they're not all alike. Far from it. In fact, digestive tracts are specially adapted to animals' feeding behavior and diet. For instance, a housefly eats mostly liquid or very finely granulated food, but before it does that, it's got to puke its digestive juices all over its lunch mm. and then let them digest it for a while before it sucks it up into its mouth. If we did it like that, first dates would be less common. Most vertebrates put food in one end of the tube and our digestive system processes it and then it gets rid of the waste out the other end of the tube. No muss, no fuss. Well actually there's a little bit of muss at the end, you may have noticed. But the beauty of it is that this whole process is run by our autonomic nervous system so we don't have to think about it until maybe the very last step when we're in traffic and just had two cups of coffee and a bran muffin. Then we have to think about it a little bit. Among vertebrates, the digestive tract might be short or long or have organs that do different things depending on what its feeding habits are. For instance, dogs are mostly carnivores and also scavengers. They mostly eat meat, but sometimes that meat's been dead for a while. So the dog's digestive system has developed to take food in, absorb as many nutrients as possible, and then deposit it on somebody's lawn all in a period of about six hours. Dogs have an extremely short digestive tract because if you're in the habit of eating rotten meat, you'd better be able to digest it fast. If you don't, the bad bacteria that's probably living on that armadillo carcass is going to take up residence in your gut and put you in a world of hurt. Cows, on the other hand, take a very, very, very long time to digest their food, around 80 hours, because they have to process plants, mostly grass. Grass has a ton of cellulose in it, and evolution has yet to produce an animal that can manufacture a stomach acid or enzyme tough enough to break down cellulose. So cows have microorganisms in their guts that break down the cellulose for them. This process takes a four-chambered stomach, each one with a slightly different microecology, and a lot of cud chewing, or regurgitating and rechewing of grass, before it passes all the way through. So nature is full of crazy digestion stories, and I honestly wish that I had time to tell them all. But let's focus on human digestion from now on, mostly because you're probably a human, we don't assume anything here, and you'll be wanting to know how your body does all this stuff. And two, 
humans actually have a pretty good all-purpose digestive system. We're omnivores, after all, we eat plants and meat, so our systems are generalized to handle all kinds of stuff. Like most animals, humans have a bunch of different acids and enzymes in our digestive tracts that break down food so that it can be absorbed and used by our bodies. But the secret to successful digestion is maximizing the surface area. In more than one way, actually. The first way we maximize surface area is on the food itself. So say I take a bite out of this apple. Right now, it's like an apple boulder sitting there in my mouth. <laughs> I got enzymes in my saliva that immediately start breaking it down, like the outsides of the boulder. If I swallowed this, this chunk whole right now, not only would it hurt like heck, the rest of my digestive system would have a really hard time dealing with it because most of the enzymes and acids would have the same difficulty working all the way through this big solid hunk. But when I use my awesome teeth to chew up this hunk of apple, suddenly there's double, triple, quadruple the surface area on the food. I'm making up apple gravel from the apple boulder. Maybe even apple sand. For humans, chewing is key because breaking down our food into smaller and smaller bits allows enzymes and acids to get at them. And after our teeth have made the pieces small enough, the chemicals break them down further until they're fine enough for our bodies to absorb nutrients from them. But it's not just the surface area of the food that's important. The surface area of the digestive system is key to the whole process as well. Last time I talked about how we have a whole bunch of surface area in our lungs to absorb tons of oxygen all at once. Well, our digestive system works in much the same way. Most of the absorption of nutrients happens in our small intestines, and the length of the average human adult's small intestine is about seven meters. Plus, inside our small intestines there are a bunch of little folds and little <laughs> fibers with absorbing fibers on them, and no, I didn't misspeak, the fibers have fibers! That's how hard our intestines work to increase their surface area. Last episode I was all impressed that lungs have a total surface area of 75 square meters, Well, the small intestine has a surface area of 250 square meters. Blech. Kind of gross. I wouldn't want to see it spread out over a tennis court or anything. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. Digestion does not start at the small intestine, people. It starts at the mouth. Now, as you can see, this hot pocket is surrounded by some kind of bread, if you can call it that. Bread is a starch which breaks down into glucose. When I start gnawing on a piece of bread, you can do the outside here so it's most bread. The glands in my mouth start secreting <laughs> saliva, which contains salivary amylase an enzyme designed to break down starch into glucose. The more I chew, the more amylase will get to all the different sides of the bread, and that's why the more you chew bread, the sweeter it tastes. Amylase doesn't really do much to the meat of the cheese in this thing. I've got other enzymes and acids that are gonna work on them later on in the system, but I am gonna chew all that stuff up real good right now so that those other enzymes can do their jobs later. I'm gonna swallow all this. So now the masticated hot pocket has passed down my pharynx or throat and into my esophagus, which leads to my stomach. There's actually this little cool flap of tissue called the epiglottis that blocks the trachea when I swallow so that the food doesn't end up in my respiratory system. So this ball of food that I just swallowed actually has a scientific name. It's called a bolus and it rides a kind of wave of muscle action down the esophagus into the stomach. This wave-like contraction of the smooth muscles around the tube of the esophagus is called peristalsis and it's basically how most of the movement in your digestive system is accomplished. Now my hot pocket bolus is in my stomach now, which is where the food really starts getting manhandled. Stomach basically takes a scorched earth approach to digestion. It, it's not messing around. It's like a churning cement mixer that can contract and expand with these big accordion-like folds of muscle called rugi. Your stomach's job is to turn everything over and over, smushing and mixing all the pieces up with its cocktail of acids and enzymes called gastric juice. Gastric juice is mainly made up of hydrochloric acid, an enzyme called pepsin, and, and some mucus and water. Hydrochloric acid has a pH of about 1, which is strong enough that if you got it on your hand, it would give you a chemical burn, so the acid breaks things down and hopefully kills most of the bacteria that you might find on your food. And the pepsin starts breaking down proteins into amino acids. Now that mucus is important. It's there to protect your stomach so that it doesn't, like, digest itself. When you don't have enough of that mucus, you get peptic ulcers, which happen when your stomach lining comes in direct contact with your stomach acid. And the water's just in there to make everything all soupy, because what you want by the time your food leaves your stomach is chyme, which is a kind of liquidy slop that you might be familiar with from the last time you had a stomach virus. You know this conversation was gonna have to get a little bit gross, and I didn't want to bring diarrhea into it too much, because, you know, I've been eating. But when something bad is going on in your digestive tract, your body doesn't worry too much about absorbing nutrients, it just wants to get the chyme out of there. So chyme is what you see when 
you get the picture. Anyway, there's a little valve or sphincter between the stomach and the small intestine that regulates how much chyme gets into the small intestine and when it gets in there. The very beginning of the small intestine is called the duodenum. This is where a lot of the small intestine action happens, by which I mean lots of things get absorbed and also secreted, like bicarbonate, which neutralizes the gastric acid before it goes any further. Now the coolness of the small intestine can't be overstated. It's ground zero for cellular exchange of nutrients and the breakdown of fats. And again, the reason it's so good at absorbing is because all of the surface area it's got going on. <coughs> ah, that surface area comes from the fact that despite its name, your small intestine is freaking long. In a human, it can range anywhere from 4.5 to 10.5 meters. But that's not all. The whole inside is lined with epithelial tissue and has tons of ridges and folds in it surface area to the max. And on those ridges and folds are these little hair-like fibers of flesh called villi. Each villus has capillaries on it so that it can absorb nutrients. And get this, each villus, which is only like half a millimeter long, is covered in teeny tiny little microvilli, providing even more surface area. In fact, apparently, the small intestine has a texture kind of like velvet, which is, ah. Oh, great. Now I eat the milkshake. Fantastic. Okay. So another thing the small intestine does with the help of its friend the gallbladder is break down fatty stuff like this milkshake. Near the top of your small intestine is a little pipe where bile salts manufactured by the liver and stored by the gallbladder are squirted out into the small intestine. Bile works like dish detergent on a pan you just fried something in. It's an emulsifier. It takes hydrophobic fat molecules and breaks them up into fatty acids and monoglycerides, which can be absorbed by all that bile tissue. I've never had Chunky Monkey before. Mmm. Mmm. <laughs> Nuts. After your food passes through those yards and yards of small intestine, the chyme goes through another sphincter and enters the cecum the beginning of the large intestine. The large intestine's job is to remove most of the water and bile salts from the chyme so you don't have constant diarrhea, so you can thank it for that. It's called large because it's wider than the small intestine, but it's not nearly as long. It's basically just a one and a half meter victory lap around the outside of the small intestine, and then it calls it good. Also, should mention, at the end of the cecum, there's a little tube where the appendix comes in. For a long time we thought that the appendix was a worthless vestigial structure that we used to need at some point in our evolution, but didn't need anymore. However, recent studies are finding that the purpose of the appendix in modern humans is probably to act as a safe house for all the good bacteria you need to help you digest your food. If you get a virus or food poisoning or something and all your digestive systems say, GET IT ALL OUT OF ME! The appendix has a little sample of your gut bacteria that it's to help you recolonize after your illness. So I think you're probably familiar with the final step in the digestive system, that's the pooping. Your food can spend as long as three days in your digestive tract, and a lot of that time is spent in the large intestine, mostly reabsorbing the excess water from the chyme and prepping your poo for its great entrance into the world. When it's done, it passes through everybody's favorite sphincters, the anal sphincters, there are two of them, and you know, out in the world, to live its own life. And that's the end of our little tale here that begins with the Hot Pocket. I hope you join us next time for more disgustingness as we discuss the details of the excretory system. Until then, bon appetit. Thank you for watching this episode of Crash Course Biology. If you want to go back and review anything, <coughs> table of contents, just click on it. Thanks, of course, to everybody who helped put this episode together. If you have questions for us, please leave them in the comments below or on Facebook or Twitter, and our team of experts will attempt to answer. Goodbye. All right, so uh, that is sort of a animated version of, of everything we're going to kind of go through here real quick. Um, so uh, we're going to go ahead and start with ingestion, right? If we're, if we're talking about, you know, uh, our entire alimentary canal, we have to start by, you know, getting all of that food into our body, right? So like I said, the whole purpose of your digestive tract, your alimentary canal and all that is to process food, right? It's, it's yeah. going to break it down into individual components, right? Uh, so it's going to um, uh, do this through mechanical processing like chewing, and it's going to do it through chemical processing uh, like in your stomach. Your stomach acid is going to actually dissolve things. And so uh, in the mouth, you're gonna start with uh, the chewing here, right? Uh, chewing is, is that first part, that mechanical processing. You're basically trying to increase the surface area of stuff because eventually all of this food has to uh, be exposed to like stomach acid. So, you know, if you think about like 
if you were to just swallow an entire like big chunk of food, right? Like if you swallowed a chunk of food, like the size of this little square that I've drawn here, right? Um, you know, stomach acid is going to try to get at that and it's going to kind of, you know, it's going to get here and here and, you know, it's going to try to dissolve all this and, you know, it'll probably work pretty well. It'll kind of dissolve around the outside here, but it doesn't really have very much surface area. It's just not as very much exposure to that stomach acid, which is why instead we start chewing things up and then, you know, that becomes, you know, let's say like four little chunks instead, right? It's the same size, right? But now there's more surface area, right? I can get to this section. I can get in here. I can get over here. Um, you know, I can expose it more. And then if I were to, you know, make that even smaller and get even more exposure to it, right? And now I've broken it up into even more little tiny chunks. Um, you know, that is going to have even more increased surface area. So I always like to think of like what I'm imagining surface area, like imagine if you had to, to paint this first square, right? You would basically just kind of paint around the outside of it. Um, like you got to paint all the walls. You got to paint this wall and this wall and this wall and this wall, right? It's going to take way more paint over here because you got the same amount around the outside. Same amount of paint you were using before, but now you got to use all this as well, and all this, and all this, and all that. And then again, same amount around the outside, but now there's even more in between each one of these. So that is one of the ways that we look and see that there is an increased amount of surface area. So we are going to increase the amount of surface area of the food mechanically by chewing it up into small chunks, and that will make the uh, chemical processing of digestion much easier because stomach acid will be able to get more exposure to all of those chunks of food. Um, and also remember, there is a little bit of chemical digestion that takes place in your mouth as well. We talked about this yesterday, right? Your mouth secretes this material called saliva. Saliva, that's your spit, right? Uh, is is going to be secreted by your salivary glands, these little like little glands that live in your mouth. There's a couple right here. Do you ever eat something really sour and your cheeks kind of cramp up <laughs> uh, here and then underneath your tongue? And then there's a couple back here as well. Um, that's all uh, releasing saliva into, uh, into the area, right? And so that saliva has this material in it called salivary amylase, right? So salivary amylase um, is produced by your salivary glands, and it is going to be doing a little bit of chemical breakdown of food, right? Salivary amylase is an enzyme. So it is actually a protein, uh, <clears throat> but it's an enzyme that kicks off chemical reactions with carbohydrates in particular. Um, so carbohydrates are going to start breaking down um, uh, in your saliva, right? It's not just water. Like if you were to drop, like I, I think I said this yesterday, but if you were to take a, <clears throat> a piece of bread and drop it in water, I wonder if I can find a picture of that. Yeah, if you were to drop like a piece of bread and water, it, for the most part, it's going to kind of maintain its shape fairly well, you know? Um, I mean, it's going to break down a little bit because water naturally breaks stuff down through hydrolysis, um, but it's not going to like fully, fully, fully break down. In your saliva, though, because there are all these enzymes, it'll actually start to break up those carbohydrates because carbohydrates are these big, long chains of individual sugars, and you're going to be cleaving it. Now, you can't break it down into single sugars. Salivary amylase is pretty strong, but it's not that strong. It's not strong enough to break a carbohydrate down into individual sugars. What it can do is it can break it into double sugars. So if we look at like a, uh, if we look at like a big long chain of carbohydrates here, right? Um, like here's glycogen. That's, that's kind of a little too big, actually. <laughs> Let's take this one. <laughs> um, right, so this is, this is actually glycogen. This is actually inside your body. This is what your body synthesizes. But regular carbohydrates, they kind of look like this. I, I guess I could just look up a, a starch. Let's look that up. Um, um, there we go. All right, so here's a starch, right? 
Uh, let's say this is like, you know, found in bread or a potato or something like that. Well, salivary amylase, it, like I said, it can't fully break this down. It can't get it into, you know, individual little glucose molecules. Like it's not good enough at breaking stuff down to where you get individual little glucose molecules, right? Uh, but what it is really good at it is it can break it into what we call a disaccharide. A disaccharide is a double sugar molecule. So it can break it down like this. It's gonna take that carbohydrate, that starch, potato or bread or whatever it happens to be, and it's gonna break it down into little double sugar molecules, right? And now these double sugar molecules are gonna be much easier to process when we get to the later parts of your digestive system later on, right? We're just gonna keep kind of cleaving off these little double sugar molecules until eventually we're left with nothing but these. Now, double sugar molecules, this can't pass into your bloodstream. They're still too big. They won't go into your bloodstream. Um, and that's why we have more digestion that's gonna take place when we get to the small intestine. But for now, this is sort of what that looks like. Salivary amylase is gonna do that. By the way, this is gonna do this with fats as well. You're also gonna create another material in your saliva that's called uh, lingual lipase. Um, and that's going to help break down fats, which if you start thinking about it, explains why, what are our favorite foods? Stuff that's full of carbohydrates, stuff that's really fatty, right? Like those are the delicious foods that kind of get us into trouble a little bit. You know, <laughs> like those are the ones that are really um, getting a little bit broken down. And, you know, uh, you've also got taste buds in your mouth as well. And so, you know, you start breaking those materials down. If you guys want to do a really fun but super gross experiment at home, <laughs> you can try this. Go grab a, <clears throat> a piece of bread or like a cracker, you know, like a saltine or something like that, and chew it up in your mouth and just kind of keep chewing it for about two straight minutes. <laughs> like that's a long time to be chewing, um, way longer than you need. Um, but what'll happen is you will notice that that cracker or that bread it starts to get sweeter. It'll taste a little sweet, almost as if you, there's some sugar in there. And that's because you're taking this big, long, complicated chain of carbohydrates, and you're actually breaking it down into di or double sugar uh, disaccharides. You're breaking it into almost a full sugar, but not quite. Um, and you can experience that and it's gross and kind of fun. So that's what salivary amylase is, right? It's produced uh, by your salivary glands and it's got some electrolytes in it. It's got some digestive enzymes. It's got lingual lipase in it. That's your saliva, right? That one helps break down fats. Uh, there's actually some regular proteins and metabolic wastes in there as well. Uh, that's actually what bacteria lives on, which is why everybody has morning breath, you know? <laughs> um, uh, but eventually it's going to work its way out of your mouth and into your esophagus, which doesn't really do any digestion. It's really just there to kind of act as a connection point between where digestion is taking place here and where digestion is taking place in your stomach. So your esophagus is going to kind of work its way down. Um, you will see there is a uh, what is called the esophageal hiatus, which is actually kind of fun. Um, uh, if you look, it's basically this little hole <laughs> that runs through your diaphragm. So this is your diaphragm. This is a, a muscle that's responsible for us breathing, actually. We'll be talking about the diaphragm when we get to the respiratory system. But basically, this is a little dome-shaped muscle. It sits like this when it's resting. And then when it contracts, it flattens down, and that draws your lungs open. And that's how we breathe. Uh, and there's a hole in it. <laughs> in fact, there's, there's a couple holes in it, right? Um, and that allows blood vessels to kind of work their way up to our brain. And then, then you can see this is where our esophagus is going to kind of run down and then also like, you know, branch down into uh, uh, individual components there. So, you know, we got veins and we got a, an artery there and then we got uh, our esophagus kind of running through because our stomach is underneath the diaphragm. Um, so eventually we get to the stomach, right? Oh, actually, there will also be a little sphincter there. Uh, a sphincter is basically like a little valve that closes. You can picture it like, um, uh, what do they call those doors on like submarines? Uh, submarine. Uh, 
not that type. Uh, the circular type. You see them in like sci-fi movies and stuff. Whatever. Uh, you know, like a bank vault, right? Where the door kind of closes like this, right? That's kind of what a, a sphincter is. It'll kind of close up like that and open up like that. And it keeps stuff from moving, you know, from too far from one end to the other. Like if you're, you know, you have stretch receptors in your stomach, right? That are in charge of sensing like how dissolved your food is. And if food gets to the end of your stomach and <laughs> those stretch receptors say, um, that's not really finished being broken down, right? It's still like really big chunks. Well, then the sphincter will remain closed and that way the food can't leave your stomach. But if, you know, it's like, oh, that's wet, that's soupy, you know, that's all fully broken down, the sphincter will open up and then the food passes into your small intestine. So we've also got one uh, at the very top of our stomach. Uh, that is going to prevent food from, you know, working its way back up. Uh, you could hang upside down, actually, and eat food, and it would still travel the direction it's supposed to go, thanks to that series of sphincters and stuff. Um, now, one of the other things that you'll see uh, when we're talking about uh, moving all of this food, you know, we're, we're talking about like moving food from one place to another. Well, your digestive system is made up of what we call smooth muscle. You've actually got three types of muscle inside your body. We'll talk more about this next module. Um, when you look at muscle tissue, there are three main types. Uh, and they look kind of different from one another, right? You can see here, you've got skeletal muscle. This is the stuff that we use to, you know, contract and move around our skeleton. Uh, and then you've got cardiac muscle over here. That's the stuff that's found in your heart. Um, it's a little bit more tightly packed than skeletal muscle is because it needs to be able to contract all together. You can see the fibers are actually tied together. Uh, and then over here, we got this smooth muscle, right? And look at how it's, it's, it is very smooth, right? It doesn't have these like striations. Smooth muscle can contract just like your skeletal muscle can, but it cannot contract as hard, <laughs> right? Like you, none of us are going to go to the gym and deadlift with our, you know, large intestine, you know, <laughs> if you're doing that, you got a problem, you know, um, but it does have some contractile ability. And that allows food to kind of move from place to place to place to place to place. We call that little contractions, we call that peristalsis. It's like a wave-like contraction. Um, I, last night, finally finished a tube of toothpaste. My girlfriend's been telling me to throw it away for, for a few days now. <laughs> and I was like, no, there's still a little bit left in there. You know, I was like, <laughs> and that's, you know, when you do that with your tube of toothpaste, right? You're like, you'll do a little squeeze from the bottom and you're like, you do that and eventually push all that toothpaste to the end of the tube. That's actually kind of how peristalsis contracts. Your, your digestive system basically squeezes kind of like this, and that's how it moves food throughout your digestive system, which you've felt, by the way, if you've ever taken a chunk of food that was a little bit bigger than it was supposed to be, and you can find, kind of feel it traveling the whole way down, you know, that is, uh, you're feeling that peristalsis sort of in action. Um, so that peristalsis is going to propel this chunk of food that we call a bolus. Uh, we're going to propel that food into our actual stomach. And that is where the real heavy lifting of digestion <coughs> is going to take place. So we did a little bit of digestion in the mouth with the chewing and the saliva. Uh, but uh, when we talk about, you know, digestion, that's really what we mean, right? At the mouth, that chewing process, we call that mastication. It's the opening and the closing of the mouth. It's this, right? Uh, chewing, swallowing, and then peristalsis is gonna kind of move it into our actual stomach. Now your stomach uh, is this sort of J-shaped pouch. When you look at your stomach, you know, it kind of looks like this, right? It kind of looks like the letter J in a, a little, you know? <laughs> um, there we go, right? Um, so that is your stuff. And look at all these different layers, right? You can see a layer here and a different layer. And like this one goes this way and this one goes this way and the next one goes that way, right? And it creates these kind of overlapping layers um, that is allowing the secretion of certain materials in your stomach. It allows you to secrete primarily this material called hydrochloric acid. So hydrochloric acid, if you break it down and you look at the words, right? What's it going to have in it? Well, it's going to have a lot of hydrogen right? High for, for the hydrogen, right? And then chlorine, it's going to have a lot of chlorine. So here's what's weird about your stomach acid, guys. It's not that dissimilar from like bleach, 
<laughs> I mean, it's different for sure. Do not go drinking bleach. Uh, that will mess you up real bad. But uh, it is actually, and certain people have recommended it, if you remember a couple of years ago. <laughs> um, so uh, your stomach has what is called hydrochloric acid, which is a very, very acidic material. In fact, it's so acidic. If you were to take your own stomach acid, and you reached into your stomach and you pulled a little jar of it and you poured it on your arm, you would get a chemical burn on your arm. It would literally start dissolving the skin on your arm because that's what hydrochloric acid does. It eats protein. It takes proteins and it unfolds them. Uh, this is my favorite. I'm not very good at drawing, um, but my favorite thing to draw is proteins. Really quickly, take a look. Here's a protein for you guys. Art. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is kind of how biologists usually draw proteins. We like to draw them in these big squiggles, basically. <laughs> What's that, David? Oh, freaking, um, when you said that, like, that just, uh, it brought me back to, like, a few years ago when I was in middle school. Uh -huh. People used to say that all the time, like, because they thought they were funny to, like, drink bleach <laughs> and stuff. But what you're talking about right now, we actually went over in, like, eighth and ninth grade, where you're talking yeah. about the whole stomach acid stuff. Totally. Uh, our, te our teacher was telling us pretty much that uh, you in your stomach, there's a thin layer of mucus. That yep. prevents the stomach acid from actually tearing up your stomach. Exactly. So, so when you don't eat, like when you don't eat for a while and you feel like these cold, like these cold burns in your stomach, that means the acid's like eating away at that mucus, right? Yep. Your hunger pangs are where, yeah, your stomach acid is trying to dissolve your stomach itself. <laughs> um, so those are all the individual layers, right? You can see here, this layer is where you're gonna create this, we call this the submucosal layer, um, where you're creating a little bit of mucus. And then the mucosa layer <clears throat> is really responsible for like being lined in mucus. If you've ever heard of an ulcer, right? Um, a stomach ulcer, is where someone actually uh, dissolved a piece of their stomach. You can see it's a little hole in their stomach that stomach acid can actually leak out of. And it's where they ran out of mucus. This is actually one of the symptoms of eating disorders. If you um, don't get enough nutri nu nutrients, if you do not eat food because maybe you're afraid of, of, of gaining weight and things like that, um, you can actually end up with an ulcer because your stomach acid's got to eat something. You know, um, so uh, I'm going to show you guys a little video here uh, of hydrochloric acid. This is one of my I've, I've shown this video in class before. So some of you guys might actually have known, known this video, but I love this video because um, the scientist in this video is the most scientist looking scientist in the world. Uh, <laughs> like this guy is such a stereo. He looks like a scientist. Um, this is a real b &H customer story. Steph Mandis came to b &H to take her photography to the next. Okay, so this is what happens to a hamburger when you let it sit in hydrochloric acid. This video is real gross, by the way. Yes. Yes. Fumes coming out of this. So this is concentrated yeah. hydrochloric yeah. acid. Your stomach acid would actually be a little bit better at dissolving this hamburger than, than the hydrochloric acid that is pure is, um, it's not as acidic as, you know, the concentrated hydrochloric acid, but your stomach acid also has other materials in it that we'll talk about in just a second, but um, <clears throat> they're gonna take this and McDonald's drop McDonald's cheeseburger. Still warm. <laughs> tempted to eat it. Okay, so we're gonna leave our Burger to digest for a while in the acid. Come back later and see what's happened. Unlike most of the chemicals I talk about, <laughs> I can be absolutely <laughs> sure that every person watching has a sample of hydrochloric acid with them as they watch. Because hydrochloric acid is found in everybody's stomach and it's part of our digestive process. So as you're watching me, churning away in your stomach is hydrochloric acid, which is one of the first stages in which food is broken down 
into usable components to give you energy or make you fat? It's uh, <laughs> ooh, t three and a half hours. So we're going to see what happens to a tasty McDonald's cheeseburger after three and a half hours of concentrated hydrochloric acid. Okay. Ooh. <laughs> oh my God. I think it's absolutely disgusting. <laughs> Ugh. <laughs> Ugh. So, I mean, the fats aren't really going to dissolve very well because in your stomach, there's lots of bile acids and things in your actual body to do <laughs> digestion. This is just pure HCL. So, um, ironically, that burger would actually dissolve a lot better in your stomach acid than it would in the concentrate. Um, but that is how hydrochloric acid works. It is very, 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 very acidic. And that chemically breaks down our foods. Now, you can have another material in there as well that's known, uh, you know, and, and by the way, we don't just call your stomach acid. We don't call it just straight up, you know, stomach acid. Um, we actually call it gastric juice, uh, which is sort of the, the name for, you know, where it has hydrochloric acid and has these other materials in it like mucus and, and, and stuff like that. But one of the things you're also gonna find in there is what's known as pepsin. Um, you might remember yesterday we talked about amino acids, right? Uh, if you look at like a, a double sugar molecule, right? We were drawing these all day yesterday, right? Double sugar molecule, it's got this single little bond here, right? A little single line that's kind of held together with the oxygen, just like we saw yesterday. Right. Um, but if you look at like an amino acid, um, you'll notice that amino acids are actually held together. Actually, hold on. Uh, with a double bond. See a little double bond right there, the two lines actually, right? So the double bond, which is actually up here, is kind of holding that together. And then over here is the single one. We call that a peptide bond. And peptide bonds are how you hold proteins together. So proteins are held together a little bit better than carbohydrates are. So we, be, we need a special material to help break that down. We call that material pepsin. <clears throat> pepsin is gonna digest proteins by breaking the peptide bonds that hold your amino acids together. So if we looked at an amino acid chain, you know, which might look something kind of like this. Like I said, the way we draw proteins, we often just draw them as, you know, sort of little squiggles, right? Um, remember earlier, we were cleaving off sugar molecules, like until we had like, you know, two sugar molecules at a time. Well, the same thing is true for amino acids. We're basically just going to break these all off all by themselves. Um, so we're going to take this one. Good Lord. Uh, we're going to take this one and we're going to break it off and then we'll take this one and we'll break it off and we'll take that one and we break it off. And the way we're breaking these bonds is thanks to the pepsin that is in our digestive tract, right? Um, it's in our hydrochloric acid. And now that I've got all these amino acids in this order right, or broken down into individual ones, right? That's catabolic. What can I do? I can reassemble them and I can put them in whatever order I want, right? I can reassemble them to to maybe look like this in this order instead. Um, and now that it's a different order, you know what that means? It means it's a different protein. So maybe this was like a chicken breast that I just dissolved. And now it is a piece of DNA that's gonna go in my body and tell my body how to, you know, how to replicate and make new stuff. Or maybe it's a piece of muscle. Um, and now it's, it's Brad muscle instead of chicken muscle, you know? <laughs> um, <clears throat> and that is the, the order you know, that we're going to kind of assemble it in. So um, there's other stuff in there as well. There's intestinal lipase and sucrase and maltase. and lipase. All these things are going to help break down a little bit of carbohydrates, but there's a whole bunch of enzymes in your digestive uh, tract. There's in your stomach acid, right? And all the, the big ones though are going to be hydrochloric acid uh, and pepsin. So the next thing that's going to happen, that's that's digestion. We have any questions so far, by the way? Questions, comments, or concerns? How y'all feeling about digestion so far? Feeling good. Feeling good? Love it. 
<clears throat> All righty. Um, so uh, now we're going to kind of work our way into the next process, which is the actual absorption. So we got to get all of those materials into our bloodstream. So I need to make this stuff so small that it can pass through the walls of my digestive tract into my bloodstream, right? Um, <clears throat> and that's going to primarily happen in the small intestine, which is the next stop on our digestive tract. So your small intestine, if you were to lay it out, it would actually be about this long. You can see that is pretty freaking big there. Um, and uh, it is gonna be made up of a couple different sections here. So it's this little tube that kind of coils itself around and fills your uh, abdominal cavity. Actually, I was trying to find a picture of it there. Um, let's see here. So here's your small intestine. There's, and we got different colors here representing the different sections. So, you know, it's basically going to start here at the stomach and it's going to kind of work its way down. And then it's going to fold and coil and kind of fill up your entire abdominal cavity there. And then it's going to keep folding and coiling, you know. And this little blue section here, this is called the duodenum or duodenum. Uh, and then this section here, that's what's called your jejunum. And then this section here is called your ileum. And eventually it will attach to your large intestine, which is going to kind of circle its way around and then work its way out of the body. So your small intestine, like I said, it's attached to your stomach. And this is where really the really, really heavy lifting of absorption is going to take place. So absorption is the process of allowing chemicals to pass from the digestive system into your bloodstream. Uh, I always like to think of it, you know that, I can't remember what that toy is. Uh, I don't know what this type of toy is called. Uh, they always have them at doctor's offices. Uh, not that one. Uh, <laughs> oh God, what's that? This one. <laughs> you know, this thing right here, right? Um, so this toy, you know, you can't fit the circle in the, in the star. You can't get the little half moon in the circle. You know, <clears throat> you need to get the right thing to, re, you know, to, to, to go through the right slot, right? It's got to be the right shape. It's got to be the right size, right? Well, that is what I picture in my brain every time I think of absorption in your small intestine, right? If you've got something, let's say, you eat something um, that, you know, uh, let's say you eat something that isn't food, right? You're, you're, you're really hungry and you accidentally eat like the plastic wrapper to like a piece of candy, right? <laughs> like you swallow that plastic wrapper. Well, guess what? Your stomach acid doesn't dissolve plastic. That's not really the kind of material it's very good at dissolving, you know? So that plastic wrapper is gonna kind of stay the same shape it is. And it's gonna pass into your small intestine. And because it didn't get dissolved small enough, it can't really fit into your small, into your bloodstream. It doesn't have slots for plastic. This is actually one of the reasons why we can't taste plastic. Plastic doesn't really have a taste, right? It's just kind of blank, you know? Um, and it's because we don't have uh, taste buds. We don't have sensor receptors for plastic. Here's a fun fact for you. Cats, house cats, lions, tigers, bears, yeah, not bears, lions, you know, cats and stuff. Guess what? they cannot taste carbohydrates. They do not have taste buds that taste sugar because cats are strictly carnivores. Dogs, they are omnivores. They can eat carbohydrates, they can eat proteins, they can eat fats. Cats don't eat carbohydrates. They strictly eat protein. And so they don't have taste buds. If you give a cat something really sweet, they don't know that it's sweet. They have no idea. They can't taste it because it's not food for them in the same way that plastic or aluminum cans, those are not food for us. You lick an aluminum can, it doesn't really have much of a taste, right? Uh, but if you lick like an iron bar, um, I don't know why you're doing this, by the way. Uh, <laughs> um, it kind of, it tastes like iron. Well, guess what? Iron is one of our essential nutrients. So we have taste buds for the things that are food. Well, we also have slots that can fit materials into our bloodstream for things that are food. Stuff that is not food for the most part passes straight through us. Now, obviously we can trick our taste buds. You know, there's things like artificial sweeteners, you know, like Splenda and Sweet and Low and stuff like that. That's not actually food either. Um, but your taste buds thinks it is. 
Um, but what will happen is those sweeteners will actually pass through your digestive system and your digestive system doesn't have the tools necessary to break down sweet and low or Splenda or an artificial sweeteners, right? Because it's not really food. So when it gets to your small intestine, it doesn't pass into your bloodstream and it just kind of, you, you know, eventually will work its way to your kidneys and you'll just kind of pee it out. Um, and that's one of the ways that, uh, uh, they know that people actually pee in pools. <laughs> um, they can't test it for urine. <laughs> what they can test it for is, uh, artificial sweeteners. Well, I'll show you a whole video on that later. It's really funny. Um, <clears throat> so you've got all these little slots in your small intestine that allow protein and carbohydrates and fats to pass into your bloodstream, vitamins, minerals, and a little bit of water, right? So your small intestine is the primary site for absorption in the body. The first section is the duodenum. The duodenum um, is actually where a little bit more digestion is actually going to take place. You know, when you're thinking of the digestive system, guys, I want you to think of the small intestine. I want the first thing to come to your brain to be absorption. That's really what it's super responsible for. But there is a little bit of digestion that does take place in the small intestine. Um, you are going to have this little uh, accessory. I'm going to jump down here for just a second. But you're going to have this little accessory organ that is attached to your small intestine called your liver. Uh, your liver is really, really important. It's one of the most important organs in your body. And it is going to produce this material called bile. And when it creates that bile, it's going to store it in this little tiny other organ, this other little accessory organ called your gallbladder. So gallbladder is going to get stored in, uh, or, or bile is going to get stored in the gallbladder. And then the gallbladder is going to drop it off into your small intestine. Now, what is bile? Why do we need bile? Well, bile is what we know, what we call an emulsifier. Um, if you guys have ever tried to clean off like a greasy pan, you know, uh, like you cook hamburger meat, you use water, it doesn't do anything. You know, you could use water all day and it just, the grease just kind of stays on there. But if you squirt just a little bit of dish soap, it breaks all that fat up and it comes right off the pan. That is what bile does inside your body, right? If you look at fat, you know, fat is what we call hydrophobic. It's afraid of water. Um, so whenever you drop fat in water, you know, it looks like this. It kind of lumps itself all up together, right? Creates these big, we call them a like globule. You know, it'll kind of lump itself together just like that. And that's because oil fat <coughs> is afraid of water. So when it does this, it makes these big, you know, kind of empty, you know, these big lumps, right? Um, well, if you drop an emulsifier in there, emulsifiers break it up into individual little fat droplets and it can get it small enough to pass into your bloodstream. So again, the whole point of digestion is to get stuff so small that it can pass through the walls of our small intestine into our bloodstream. And uh, your stomach acid is not so good at that when it comes to fat. And that's where your accessory organs like bile comes in. So there is a little bit of digestion that does take place in the small intestine. It's also attached to your pancreas and your pancreas is going to secrete what we call pancreatic amylase, which is going to finish off any carbohydrates that happen to survive the, the saliva and the stomach acid. If it somehow made it through uninterrupted, let's say you swallowed an entire potato for some reason, uh, you know, like whole, uh, and you didn't decide to chew it or anything like that, you didn't give it any time to like dissolve in your stomach acid, um, well, your pancreatic amylase can kind of finish off some of those carbohydrates. Um, so now we're finally done with digestion, um, and we can really just look at absorption. So take a look at your small intestine here. So your small intestine, like it says, the primary site for absorption. And you'll notice that if you look at it, it's got all these little folds in it, right? Look, it's got all these little like peaks and stuff, right? So this is a big fold right here. <clears throat> and then that fold has a big fold on it, right? And then that is going to be covered in hair. Um, and so you'll see all these folds on folds on folds, right? And it looks something kind of like this, right? These big folds here. And then you'll see little tiny ones on top of that, right? And those are what we call uh, 
your villi and your microvilli. Okay, so this big fold here is a villa, is part of your villa. It's your, it's, it, we call it a villus when it's singular, but it's your, it's your villi. You got millions of them, right? And so these are microscopic little projections from your small intestine that are lined with blood vessels. So there's your bloodstream right there. So nutrients need to get small enough to pass through this wall into the bloodstream so they can be exposed, right? And so, the, and we draw it in two different colors here. Uh, <clears throat> the red is where the red blood cells show up and the blue is where it gets taken, you know, uh, uh, back to the heart. And so it can be delivered to, you know, wherever it happens to be going. So um, that is the individual vela. And then there's all these little hairs, these little projections there. They're going to kind of move materials around. Like if a carbohydrate lands over here and it, you know, that there's no carbohydrate slot, the carbohydrate slots up there, the vela are going to kind of wiggle and move it until it gets sucked in the right hole. So your microvilli are these little hair-like projections that move nutrients around so that like, let's say a vitamin lands over here, but it's got to get up here. It can kind of wiggle it to where it needs to go to get sucked into the actual bloodstream. So that is the villi that are lining your small intestine, right? So your small intestine is kind of furry <laughs> in a way, you know, um, which is kind of fun. Um, so that is the entire section there. Um, <clears throat> now, eventually your small intestine will attach to your large intestine. Uh, there'll be a little sphincter there that will keep nutrients from moving into the large intestine. If it's not ready, if, if all the nutrients haven't really been absorbed yet, that sphincter will remain closed so that materials have time to <clears throat> sort of pass into the bloodstream. But then eventually we'll work our way into the large intestine. And the large intestine is primarily responsible for elimination. It's primarily responsible for the pooping. You know, it's, it's responsible for getting everything out, right? Um, but there is a lot of absorption that takes place in the large intestine as well. It's an additional side of absorption where most of your water absorption is going to take place. So remember, this material that's running through your body, this is going to be real nasty looking, but we call that kind. Chyme is this wet, soupy material. That's your chyme, right? It doesn't quite look like food anymore. You know, it kind of looks like this. You know, honestly, it kind of looks like that material that we saw in the video when the burger was dissolved into that brown kind of nasty mixture, right? That's really what chyme kind of looks like. So chyme is little particles of food that's moving through. And then eventually it's broken down into individual. It's this wet, soupy mixture of nothing but chemicals that are passing into your bloodstream, hopefully, right? So <clears throat> there's a lot of water in your kind because you're drinking water all the time. You're extracting water from vegetables and fruits and foods and stuff. You know, you're drinking and, you know. Um, so that chyme has a lot of water in it. And some of it gets absorbed by your small intestine, but really your large intestine is where you're primarily absorbing a lot of water. Now, yesterday we talked about dehydration synthesis, right? When you take like a liquid and you start pulling water out of it, what happens, right? If I took, you know, a material, uh, and I'm just going to kind of draw like a little fake material here. And, you know, it's got an HO pairing over here. And over here, it's got an OH pairing, right? These are two individual molecules, right? And I pull the water out of them, right? I grab, you know, I grab this, this hydrogen right here and I pull that down there and I pull uh, this oxygen over here and I pull it down there and I grab this hydrogen over here. I pull it down here, right? I've got H2O, right? And now what's going to happen is these two molecules are going to link together, right? <clears throat> They're going to start coming together. That's dehydration synthesis. Well, that chyme starts to get more and more and more dehydrated and all the stuff links together until eventually it becomes kind of a hard packed solid material, more commonly referred to as your poop, you know? <laughs> Um, and if you've ever gotten like a stomach virus or, you know, if you've ever eaten something you weren't supposed to eat and your body was like, 
all right, everything out, you know, <laughs> and it makes a really violent exit from your body. It's usually pretty watery. Uh, and that's because it's not taking the time to dehydrate. It's not taking the time to absorb stuff because your body is going, no, 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 no. We don't want whatever that virus or whatever that bacteria, we don't want that in the bloodstream. That's how we get sick. So in order to keep you healthy, it basically is hitting the eject button, you know, and everything leaves. Um, so that is primarily your large intestine is responsible for elimination, right? Um, so let's sort of circle back here and talk about some of those accessory organs that I talked about, right? So we talked a little bit about how your entire digestive tract has all these little organs that are attached to it. Well, one of them is called your liver. And you can see your liver cells are really complicated. Look, look at this crazy complicated cell here. Um, so your liver is this accessory organ that does a lot of stuff in your body, by the way. It doesn't just, it's not just responsible for digestive stuff. It also is responsible for inside the body stuff. So for instance, like when a red blood cell gets old, um, your red blood cells are some of the fastest dying cells in your body. They don't last very long, um, you know, other than like skin cells, because skin cells get damaged all the time. Those are some of the fastest skin cells and blood cells. They do not live a very long time. Um, and when a red blood cell gets old enough that it needs to retire, it goes to your liver to one of the coolest areas in the body called the red blood cell graveyard. <laughs> I love it. If I ever start like a metal band, like if I'm ever in like a heavy metal band, I'm going to call it the red blood cell graveyard. <laughs> I always thought that was the coolest name for a band. Um, so anyway, uh, your red blood cells go there and basically your, your liver will dissolve that red blood cell into individual components. It'll make its way back to your bones and it'll get reincarnated as a new red blood cell. <laughs> um, so that's one of the things your liver does. Uh, it also detoxifies materials. This is the first stop. Once something is absorbed by your small intestine, the first place it goes uh, is straight through your liver and it's gonna detoxify. If there is a material like a virus or a bacteria that somehow gets into your bloodstream, your liver will give it an unholy beat down with enzymes and hopefully dissolve that virus or hopefully kill that bacteria. It doesn't always work. Sometimes you get sick, you know? Um, but that's what some of your, that's part of what your liver does. It also, very important to us as personal trainers, stores what we call glycogen. So we took a, a big complicated carbohydrate and we catabolically broke it down into individual sugars. Then it passed into our bloodstream. Well, guess what? Your liver can reassemble those sugars into a bigger carbohydrate called glycogen. And glycogen is basically stored carbohydrates. Let's say you're doing a marathon. You haven't eaten in a little while and you need some energy, well, your liver's got you covered. It's got glycogen. So it can release those carbohydrates into your bloodstream. Your muscles can do that as well. Your muscles and your liver both store glycogen. And that's how we keep energy sort of with us on the go. It's like having an extra gas tank in the back of your car. <laughs> um, so but when it comes to the digestive part of the digestive tract, your liver is responsible for creating this material called bile. Bile is acting as an emulsifier. It's responsible for breaking down fats. So <clears throat> it takes fats and breaks them down into individual fatty acids. We call that a monoglyceride, a single mono uh, glyceride for fat molecule, right? So single fat molecule, and that's what bile does. It emulsifies, right? Breaks fatty acids down into their individual components. Now they're small enough for absorption. Now, we've all had really fatty meals. You know, last night, my roommates and I ordered a pizza, you know, <laughs> like, um, <clears throat> and that pizza, you know, had a lot of fat in it, right? We had, you know, had extra cheese on it and all this other stuff. So there's a lot of fat in that, which means if you ever bring in like a really big, high in fat meal, your liver might not be able to create enough bile on the go to process that fat. So we have an extra little organ here called your gallbladder, which is this little pear-shaped organ right here. Uh, and it is attached to your liver. Now your gallbladder doesn't create anything. It doesn't make any materials. What it does is it stores bile <clears throat> for your liver. 
So your liver makes the bile, stores it in the gallbladder in case you have like a really big fatty meal. And then that is going to release that into your small intestine. Um, and it shares a duct with your pancreas here. Your pancreas is also attached uh, to your small intestine and it creates what we call pancreatic amylase, which is really good at breaking down carbohydrates if any of those carbohydrates happened to survive the stomach up here. So those three accessory organs are gonna help us with the process of digestion by releasing this, whatever materials they need to release in order to further break things down. So you, you can remove your gallbladder, by the way. My mom lost her gallbladder. Um, she got uh, what's called a gallstone. <clears throat> that sometimes happens when your liver, if you get too much calcium or any other type of minerals and they somehow make their way into your liver, your liver can sometimes shove them into your gallbladder by mistake and a little rock can start forming. And eventually that rock can roll over the hole and it can close up your gallbladder and that can make you really sick. Um, so what'll happen is doctors will go, hey, we gotta pull out your gallbladder. And it's like, um, that's one of my organs. Can't I, do, don't I need all those? Like, can I live without one of my organs? You can actually live pretty well without your gallbladder. Doctors will just remove it. Um, they removed my mom's and then they brought out the stone <laughs> and it was about the size of a golf ball, which is crazy. And the doctor dropped it. <laughs> my dad and I are in the waiting room. My mom's like, uh, you know, passed out from the surgery. Uh, and the doctor's like, hey, do you want to see the thing that was making your mom sick? And he was shaking it like this and it popped out of the freaking tube and rolled on the floor. <laughs> and we thought it was really funny, but, you know, not at the time. <laughs> Um, but that's, that's a, we call that a gallstone. Uh, it's very similar to a kidney stone. Um, but basically, uh, that is, uh, you can remove that and they just <clears throat> connect the tube directly from your liver straight to your small intestine. And, you know, you're still pretty good at breaking down fats. It's just, you don't have like storage. So if you ever have like a really, really fatty meal, it can cause you to feel a little sick to the stomach. Um, so that's what bile does. It emulsifies our fats by breaking them up into little tiny droplets and individual fat molecules. Um, then, like I said, you've also got the pancreas. It's going to share a duct there. It's going to create things like pancreatic amylase and pancreatic lipase. That's just going to further break down any of the materials that didn't get broken down by the stomach and the small intestine. And now everything is officially broken down and being absorbed by your small intestine. And eventually it's going to work its way into your large intestine. Your large intestine is going to be attached to your colon. That's where you're really going to do a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to water absorption. In that water, you're also going to have a lot of electrolytes like sodium and potassium, uh, calcium, even um, all of those little uh, minerals. Uh, and then a lot of vitamins are going to get absorbed here as well, particularly B vitamins. Um, water soluble vitamins um, are all going to get absorbed in your large intestine. And, you know, like I said, that's going to turn that material, that kind, that wet soupy mixture, it's not going to be wet and soupy anymore. It's going to start to become a solid. Your colon is going to squeeze it all together into what we call your stool. And then eventually you're going to eliminate it out of the body. Uh, and we're not going to talk too much about that because that's not really relevant to the realm of nutrition. Um, important for anatomists, but not really important to us. So that is the process of digestion and absorption. Do we have any questions, any comments or concerns before we move on? Uh, just a question. Yeah, what do you got? Okay, so uh, is this is in the book, right? Like, uh, is there anywhere where we could read about this in the you book? You will find this in, I want to say it's chapter 17. Uh, hold on a second. Um, hold on. I got to find what chapter that is. Uh... You'll find it in chapter 17. Okay. A little okay. bit of chapter 17 of this book right here. This one right here. Um, so uh, Simon and Alexia, you guys can see uh, this picture right here. The girl doing the push-up. 
Yeah. Um, you'll find it in chapter 17. Uh, it's really brief. It's not a very detailed breakdown. Um, but if you do want to do some light reading today, honestly, David, I think if you just stick to the PowerPoints, you'll be fine. Uh, okay. We'll be covering the reading of that chapter in a couple weeks. Um, but if you want to read it now, you want to use a sort of a review, it's not bad. It, it's got sort of a, a really fast summary breakdown. So you guys can read chapter 17 today. That will help you a little bit. <laughs> All right. So um, let's talk a little bit about nutrition, right? Let's talk about the actual nutrients. So we've been talking about all day <clears throat> how we break stuff down. Well, why do we need to eat all this food? Well, we're going to define nutrition, right? Nutrition is going to be defined as the means by which a biologic organism, that's you and me, uh, intake and absorb essential nutrients, like we just talked about, responsible for maintaining life. So you've got six essential nutrients, okay? Um, so we're gonna make our own little chart here. Uh, you get six essential nutrients, right? Uh, where are we going? Uh, that's a little bit big, there we go. Oh, whoops. Uh, one, two, three. All right, so here are our six essential nutrients. So they are going to be um, uh, carbs, carbohydrates, uh, they're going to be proteins, and you're going to have fats, right? So these are the things that you need lots of every day, right? Um, these are our like I said, this is our uh, six essential nutrients. Okay, so this is the six essential nutrients we're talking about. Pro carbs, proteins, and fats. Those are what we call macronutrients, okay? So these three are macro. Macro means really big, right? That's what macro means. Um, you need these in grams every single day. Grams, that's, that's pretty big. You know, a gram's not that big compared to like a pound, but like it is still like a lot compared uh, to like milligrams or micrograms, right? So over here, you've got vitamins and you've got minerals, okay? So vitamins and minerals, these are what are known as your micronutrients. Um, you don't need very many of these. You need these in milligrams. You need these in micrograms. And lastly, we've got water, which is the most important nutrient of all, right? Uh, that's the one that's responsible for, you know, everything we do. So, you know, um, carbohydrates, what are they? Well, they're a big complex chain of sugars, right? And what are proteins? Well, they're a big complex chain of amino acids. And fats are big complex chains of fatty acids. And then vitamins are kind of similar to proteins, um, except that they don't have any energy. They're not big enough to have any calories. Um, so they're kind of similar to proteins. They often act as enzymes and they interact very interestingly with our minerals. Minerals are inorganic. They don't have any carbon in them. They're their own individual metals or stones or whatever, right? They're their own individual materials and they help make up and give our body things like structure, you know, like calcium gives you bones, you know, potassium allows you to create electricity. So your electrolytes and things like that. Um, so your vitamins are kind of similar to enzymes and your minerals are inorganic electrolytes responsible for body functions. And then lastly, we've got water, which allows all of the carbs, proteins, fats, vitamins, and minerals to be broken down, to move around the body, to balance out our pH. We do all kinds of stuff. So let's go ahead and break these out. So that those are our six essential nutrients. And that's why you can taste those things. You can taste carbohydrates, you can taste proteins and fats. Stuff that's high in vitamins are often really tangy. 
uh, stuff that's really high in minerals will often, you know, taste minerally. You know, there's a difference between like purified water and like spring water, right? You drink like Dasani and it's purified. It pulls all the minerals out of it. So it tastes a little different. You drink like Arrowhead water. It tastes like there's dirt in there. That's the minerals that you're tasting. So um, macronutrients, right? Macronutrients are, oh, oh, got it, jumps forward. Uh, also, one thing that we're going to talk about, sorry, I'm going to skip forward just a second here. One other thing that we're going to talk about, we're also going to talk about calories. So calories don't actually exist. It's kind of a weird thing to say, but, but you wouldn't say, like, how do you tell someone what a, an inch is or a mile? You're like, I don't know, it's a unit of measurement. It's how we measure the length of something, right? There's no, you can't hold an inch. You can hold an inch of something, right? But an inch by itself, it's not really a thing, right? Same thing with like temperature, right? You can't really hold a degree, you know? <laughs> you can't really hold um, uh, a, an, an hour. These are all just measurement measuring tools, right? Well, that's what a calorie is. A calorie is the amount of energy found within a food. So basically um, what it is, the amount of energy that it is, uh, it's a unit of measurement. It is the amount of energy uh, found within a food that would raise the temperature of one gram of water, one degree Celsius. Now a gram is really small. Here's how small a gram is. It is itty bitty. But, uh, okay, that's 100 grams of water. That's a gram of water. <laughs> that is tiny, <laughs> right? Um, so if you were to try to measure that tiny gram going up one degree, it's pretty freaking difficult, right? You need a really tiny thermometer, right? Um, so <clears throat> instead, we're going to use 1,000 grams. We're going to use one kilogram of water, okay? And a kilogram of water is about as big. It's it's about a it's a liter, right? It's 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 the size of a one liter bottle of water, okay? So let's say you've got a liter bottle of water here, and you put like a beaker above it, right? Um, Uh, gosh, I just need a really simple one. Oh God, not Beaker with the Muppets. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, this is what I'm looking for. All right, so. Let's say you took one liter of water, right? A thousand grams of water, one kilogram, right? You got a kilogram of water right here. And you took a hamburger and you put it over here and you lit that hamburger on fire. And you got a thermometer in this water here. And that thermometer tells you that it increased the temperature by 500 degrees Celsius, okay? So it went from, whatever temperature it was, to 500 degrees Celsius. Well, you know what that means? That means that there are 500 calories in that hamburger. If the water went up by 100 degrees, there'd be 100 calories. If it went up by 200 degrees, it would be 200 calories. That is what a calorie is. It is the amount of heat energy found within a food that would raise the temperature of one kilogram of water one degree Celsius. At least that's what we call a kilocalorie. Now, in America, we don't use the metric system. So we don't use kilograms and, you know, things like that. So instead, we had to make things complicated. Um, a kilocalorie in the United States is what is known as an uppercase calorie, like a, a, a calorie with an uppercase C. Okay. And that is what a kilocalorie is. Um, but because we, you know, if you look at like, uh,
if you look at like, you know, or if anybody in here has immigrated to the US, you might remember looking at um, nutrition facts and it would say K cows, right? It would have like a K and then a cow. That stands for kilocalories. That is the 1000 small calories, right? Uh, instead of in the US, we use an uppercase C. It's not really all that important. It's just the original calorie was lowercase and that was one gram. And the new calorie that we actually use is uppercase C. That's a thousand lowercase c's. It's really annoying. It drives me crazy. It doesn't really play into things because we haven't used that lowercase c in decades. Um, but fun fact, the original calorie when they were discovering this stuff uh, was like a thousand. So when you have like a hamburger, <laughs> you would say back in olden times, uh, how many calories are in that hamburger? And be like, about 500,000. You know, <laughs> and then they're like, all right, well, that's too much math for average people to do. So they divided it by a thousand. And it's like, now we say, how many calories are in that hamburger? We say 500. Uh, and that just makes it easier for us to deal with. Um, so um, calories, by the way, we talk about those macronutrients, you know, carbohydrates, proteins, and fat. Uh, you are going to see that carbohydrates, for every one gram of carbohydrate, you're going to have four calories. So it would raise the temperature of the water by four degrees for every one gram of carbs. Um, 10 carbs, raise it by 40 degrees. 100 carbs, raise it by 400 degrees, right? So that's how they can tell how many grams of carbohydrates are in food. And that's how they can tell how many calories are in food. You know what's fun? Protein, one gram of protein also has four calories in it. So carbohydrates and proteins have the same amount of calories in them per gram. And then fat has nine calories per gram. So that's a lot of calories. And that's why, you know, when you have like a fatty food, you'll notice the calories move pretty quickly, <laughs> you know, uh, compared with like a protein or a carb. Um, so those are calories. We'll come back to those at the end of our lesson here. Um, but calories are the amount of energy found within food. So you need about, you know, everybody in here is going to need a different amount of energy. I need about 2,700 calories worth of energy per day to run my body based on the way I live my life, right? If I was very sedentary, I would only need about 2,000 calories per day, um, you know, uh, and that's the difference, right? That's the difference between like an active lifestyle and an inactive lifestyle. Um, and that's the difference between metabolism as well. You know, um, David, you're much younger than I am. Um, you know, uh, I'm a little bit older, so my metabolism slowed down a little bit. You probably burn closer to 3000 calories per day, you know, cause you're a little bit younger than me. Right. Um, Mir, you're also, you know, you're much more muscular than I am. <laughs> uh, you got much larger, much larger muscles than I do. You probably Thank also you. burn a few more calories than I do, even though I'm a little bit taller. So everybody's body is going to be a little bit different. Um, you know, Alexia, unfortunately, you uh, like you don't have quite as many tests. Uh, you don't create as much testosterone as men do. Uh, so your metabolism is going to be a little bit slower than probably all of us. Um, women tend to have just a little bit of a slower metabolism than men do. Uh, so you're probably burning closer to about 2000 to maybe 2200 per day. Um, and then basically just by existing, I would burn probably around 1800. I'd say David and Mir, you guys are probably around 1900. Alexia, I don't know how tall you are, but I would assume somewhere between around 1400. So that's a little bit about calories. We will talk way, 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 way more about how to understand what I just said, uh, next class, not next, not tomorrow, but in the next, in the nutrition class. Um, we'll be talking about calories and making that really clear for you guys. Um, but I wanted to introduce it today. So, um, like I said, carbohydrates, those are your, you know, they're part of your macronutrients, you need them in very large quantities, right? They're complex chains of sugar molecules, right? And so we release those sugar molecules in order to have energy. Fats, those are big complex chains of fatty acids. 
Um, there's a couple different types of fats. You know, you've got uh, you've got saturated fats and you've got unsaturated fats. That's what's kind of fun. You'll see here, saturated fats look a little bit different. They're uh, they're a big straight line, whereas unsaturated fats are sort of a bent line. Um, and that's actually why saturated fats are usually a solid and unsaturated fats are usually a liquid. Unsaturated fats are often considered healthy fats. Saturated fats are often considered unhealthy fats. Um, so when you think about like, you know, meats and things like that, those are very saturated fats, right? Uh, versus like olive oils and things like that, those are very much unsaturated fats. Um, so um, those are your lipids. Your body can use those to make energy, by the way. It can break it down through what we call beta oxidation, and it can basically use fat for energy production. Yesterday, we talked about uh, how your body will do glycolysis, then it will do the Krebs cycle, and then it will do the electron transport chain. Well, what uh, you know, glycolysis requires carbohydrates. And I know, you know some people don't eat carbohydrates. Some people are on a keto diet or some people are on a carnivore diet, right? And if you don't eat carbohydrates, how the heck do you do glycolysis? Well, you don't. You skip glycolysis and you go straight to the Krebs cycle, thanks to this process called beta oxidation. And that's how you break down fats for energy. Um, one of the other types of fats that you're going to see in your body is also called cholesterol. Cholesterol uh, is actually a precursor to a lot of your hormones inside of your body, including your sex hormones. Testosterone and estrogen are both going to be created thanks to your cholesterol. Uh, but you're going to find cholesterol, which are little individual fat molecules, also in food. And then we got everybody's favorite, which are proteins, right? Proteins are big complex chains of amino acids. So carbohydrates are complex chains of sugars, fats are complex chains of fats, <laughs> and uh, proteins are complex chains of amino acids. So amino acids are going to form together to make proteins, right? We talked about that. Uh, we talked about that earlier, right? So there are two types of um, uh, um, uh, amino acids out there. There are what are called essential amino acids, and there are what are called non-essential amino acids, okay? Sort of two different lists, right? It kind of looks like this. Here's sort of a, a working list of all of them, right? So you got the essential amino acids over here on the left and the non-essential ones on the right. What's the difference between them? Well, the difference is non-essential amino acids can be made by your body. So let's say I only ate a diet consisting of essential amino acids, and I never ate any of these non-essential ones. My body can break these up and reassemble them and make them into the non-essential ones. But if I don't have all of the essential amino acids in my diet, my body can't make them. Now, that doesn't sound like that big a deal until you remember that every protein has all 20 of those amino acids in them, right? Remember, a protein is a big, long chain of all 20 amino acids, okay? So if you don't eat essential amino acids, you might be missing one or more in the chain, which means you can't make a full protein. That is why it's so important to have a complete protein in your diet. A complete protein is a protein source that contains all essential amino acids. Now, here's the thing. Meat products, animal products, are fully uh, complete proteins. Every animal product on the planet, whether it's uh, chicken breast, fish, cow meat, um, all of those are complete proteins. Dairy, eggs, cheese, milk, all that stuff, that is all complete. Pro those are all complete proteins as well, right? Uh, because they, an animal's body assembled them, and that's why they have all the amino acids. Now, here's the thing. You'll find protein in beans. You'll find protein in rice. You'll find it in bread, right? Um, one second here.
um, you'll find protein in carbohydrate sources all the time, right? So those are incomplete proteins because they are missing one or more essential amino acids. But what's kind of cool is you can combine incomplete proteins together, right? So for instance, yesterday I had chipotle for lunch uh, and it came with beans and rice, right? Beans plus rice both come together and they fill in each other's gaps. Um, we call that a complementary protein. So a complementary protein Yeah. There we go. They fill in each other's gaps. Oh, come on. Low res picture. Uh, ah, there we go. So you might notice that the beans over here, they've got these two amino acids, but they're missing these two. But rice is missing those two. And it's got these two. So if you eat beans and rice together, you get all four. So that's what we call a complementary protein. And that's why you can get away with being a vegetarian. You don't necessarily have to consume animal products to get all of your amino acids. Um, you can be a vegetarian, you can be a vegan and still get plenty of protein and get plenty of amino acids. You just have to make sure that you're pairing them up properly. Um, so those are our macronutrients. Those are proteins, fats, and carbs. We've also got micronutrients. Micronutrients are needed in small quality. Those are going to be your vitamins and minerals. So vitamins, you got a bunch of them. You've got fat-soluble vitamins. Uh, all that means is that they are carried by fat and they dissolve in fat. Um, so your body needs to have fat in your diet in order to move fat soluble vitamins around. You've also got water soluble vitamins. They are carried and they move around thanks to water. So um, fat soluble vitamins are vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, and vitamin K. And your water soluble vitamins are all of your B complex, that's B1 through 12, and vitamin C. So those are gonna help do all kinds of really cool things in your body. Vitamin A, for instance, is gonna work uh, you know, with your body to synthesize fat and cholesterol. Vitamin D is going to work with your body to work with calcium to form your bones. Vitamin E is going to help make collagen in your skin. Vitamin K is going to act as, uh, it can help you with blood clotting. You get your B vitamins. These, you remember yesterday I showed you the Krebs cycle and I was like, good God, it's complicated, right? <laughs> I said, I was like, good Lord, look at the Krebs cycle nonsense you know it's got all these little enzymes here those are your b vitamins so b vitamins you'll often see like you know uh you'll often see them in energy drinks you know you'll see people be like it's got b vitamins in it it'll give you energy right it's packed full of b vitamins. b vitamins is complex right the b complex yeah one through 12 is the complex okay there's not okay. actually 12 of them. It skips like, you know, five and six, it, but it's, it's, yeah, it's one through 12. Okay. Um, that's your B complex. Yeah. So if you take a B complex supplement, um, that's to help give you energy. It's to help your body with the, the Krebs cycle. Um, okay. so that's it. What's funny is like, it's like, it'll give you energy. What's funny. B vitamins, they don't actually have any energy, but they do act as enzymes. They're like the key to your car. They don't have any, it doesn't have any energy of its own, but it will kind of help, right? Um, so that's one, two, three, five, six, seven, nine, and 12. <laughs> um, and then also vitamin C, which is really good for your immune system and, you know, processing materials inside the body. And then lastly, in the micronutrient category, we've got minerals. Uh, there's two major categories here as well minerals are inorganic elements. They help with our metabolism, right? Uh, calcium, chlorine, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, sodium, fun one, sulfur, by the way, needed by your body. Yeah. You know, the thing that we use for explosions. Yes. You actually do need it as an essential nutrient. Chromium, cobalt, copper, fluorine, iodine, and iron, manganese, selenium, and zinc. 
all of those minerals <laughs> are also very important inside your body. They interact with your immune system. They are responsible for your metabolism. They do all kinds of really cool things inside our body. Um, so uh, two major categories of minerals, you're gonna have major minerals and trace minerals. Um, for the record, you know, vitamins are different, like fat soluble vitamins are carried by fat, water soluble vitamins are carried by water. That's a big distinction. Those are very different from one another, right? Um, that's not the case for minerals. Minerals, every mineral is different from one another. There's no similarities between fluorine and calcium. You know, they're, they're just different. But we split them into two categories uh, called major and trace. Major minerals, all that means is that you need to eat more than 100 milligrams of them per day. Trace minerals, you need less than 100 milligrams per day. That's the only distinction. Um, and then lastly, we've got water, uh, which the PowerPoint doesn't talk about very much because it gets a lot of attention later. But water is the most essential nutrient. It cools the body, it aids in your metabolism, and it provides a means by which you can carry materials throughout your entire body. So that is digestion and nutrition in a nutshell. Um, we will get much more deep into that. We have an entire eight days dedicated to nutrition coming up once we get through physiology. But all of that will help you understand physiology as we move through it uh, for the rest of this course. So that's meant to be sort of an introduction. We'll get much, 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 much further into it uh, when we get into the actual nutrition eight-day class once we're done with our physiology 12-day class. So. Summarizing everything out, digestion is the process of breaking things down. Uh, your stomach is going to do that chemically. Your mouth is going to do that mechanically. And then once it's broken down, it's going to pass into your small intestine for absorption, where it will pass into your bloodstream. Uh, and then eventually it will pass into your large intestine, where you'll absorb all the water and any remaining minerals uh, and electrolytes and things like that. Uh, Water-soluble vitamins get absorbed in the large intestine. Um, and then uh, eventually eliminate any of the waste products. And nutrition is the process of understanding how we take in all those nutrients I've been talking about all day and actually use them. So that is everything in a nutshell. Uh, any questions, comments, or concerns today, guys? How's everybody feeling? Good. Pretty good? Well, since I haven't been in the class, I've been off and on because I got so many interruptions going on. So I need to recap. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Um, well, the video will go up around 530. It's actually there is a video up now. It's just six. It's where I taught this class six months ago. And then at 530, a recording. Of <laughs> OK. Oh, no. yeah. um, homework number one is out today, guys. So please find your way over to Canvas um, and knock that out. Remember, like I said, the easiest way to do it, stay on the home page, go to day two, download your notes, download your PowerPoint, watch the video if you want to, uh, and then click here, and that will take you over to the homework. It's 15 questions. If you don't feel like you did good on it, that is totally okay. Do it again. And if you got any questions, please feel free to shoot me a text, give me a call, and I will tutor you on anything that wasn't clear. Okay. All right, let's kill the recording.